Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to Revolutionizing Activism. My name is Steve Lambert. I am the co-founder and artistic director of the Center for Artistic Activism. And um, we're really happy to be here today with this new set of talks that we're doing. We did um, a series of them in the past that you can watch online. And then we're doing another series um, coming up. This one is on parties and the next one is about small actions that have a big impact. Um, they're a lot of fun to do and we get to talk to some great friends and amazing people. So I'm glad that you're here today. Um, also just quickly wanna say thank you to um, the generosity of the folks that make this possible. One is the Four Doves Foundation um, and Andrea Soros Columbell and then Others are people like you who make donations that allow us to do uh, weird experimental things uh, without funders at the beginning and then show them that it's actually worthwhile. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about parties in a kind of broad sense. Um, you're probably familiar with the Emma Goldman quote, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your evolution. And every time that's said, we go, yeah, right? Like, I'm into that. Um, but there's a reason that she needed to say that. And uh, I think that there's a, a tendency when things get intense or an issue gets um, kind of more serious that we think we need to be serious in order to be taken seriously. Um, and we kind of revert back to less joyful ways of getting things done. Now, um, in talking about parties, um, how activists all over the world have and continue to organize using parties and elements of parties um, have really accomplished significant change. And we have three folks here who um, I think are good examples of that in, in very different ways. Um, so uh, we often think of activism as really serious business um, that should not be light, made light of. We don't want to um, minimize kind of issues that are going on um, or the people that are effective, but play and joy can make our efforts both attractive to other people that maybe aren't as committed or aren't as involved yet, um, and more sustainable for the people that are involved. And so at the center, we often talk about how activism can feel like life draining work, um, but when it's done right, using creativity and play and the full spectrum of what it means to be a human being, including joy and fun, it can be life giving instead of life draining. Um, that said, it's it's not always easy. And um, thinking about the war in Ukraine, you can imagine trying to bring elements of a party to cleaning up sites that have been recently bombed. And yet, Ukrainian club goers figured out how to do exactly that. Um, so if in the in Ukraine um, they can bring a DJ to a war zone. Uh, maybe we can also think a little bit more expansively about what we can do and what is possible um, to, to, you know, what, where that line is. Um, we can also look at other examples of how parties and protests and movements have um, naturally or antithetically collided. Um, the New York dance clubs in the 70s sort of created, and earlier, created a place where people could practice and build a sense of community and confidence and resistance that then turned into things like uh, the Stonewall Rebellion and um, things like that. You know, like you need a, a, a place where you can kind of practice that and feel who you really are. Um, and then more recently in the Perio Combativo in Puerto Rico, where underground rap was outlawed in a crime bill and the, and that music and dance became an act of defiance for the people that were standing up against the gov uh, governor, I think there. And it was all coined by queer and trans and non-binary non -binary youth to, uh, for the most part that used perio, uh, reggaeton dance style as a way to both express their displeasure with the current government and build community. Um, so when you start looking at these intersections, they're, they're in a lot of different places. There's the Toy Toy in South Africa where song and dance are a part of every protest. Um, and then in my own past uh, at the 924 Gilman Club, which was like a DIY punk club that started in Berkeley, that was a communal space where music happened, things like that. But 
over the course of decades, the uh, people that attended that club ended up on city council defending its right to exist and things like that. You know, people may, graduated out of that and made their way into power. Um, so today we're here with three incredible activists that I'm really excited to uh, introduce and talk to more and, and share that with you. Um, one, uh, yeah, so <laughs> I'm really excited actually. So uh, Kate Kelly is a, is a advocate and a passionate activist and a lawyer. And I just want to say that lawyers are often uh, some of the most creative people. Um, in her legal career, she's had various incredible opportunities working as an Ella Baker Fellow at the Center for Constitutional Rights and Strategic Advocacy and Policy Council at the Planned Parenthood Association of Utah. Um, she has spent the last two years working in the House of Representatives, primarily on the Equal Rights Amendment. Kate is also an organizer with Shout Your Abortion, a collective that normalizes abortion and elevates safe paths to access regardless of legality. Shout Your Abortion makes resources, campaigns, and media intended to arm existing activists, create new ones, and foster collective participation in abortion access all over the country. Shout Your Abortion's recent actions have included a pop-up lemonade stand, celebratory abortion pill info stands, online storytelling festivals, and other actions that bring defiance and joy to the fight for reproductive justice. Um, Kate also hosts the podcast Ordinary Equality and has a forthcoming book also titled Ordinary Equality, which is about the history of women who have shaped the U.S. Constitution. Um, next up, we have Pata. I'll let you say your last name, Pata. Um, Pata is the founder of Georgia's first ever LGBTQ plus organization and a member of the White Noise Movement, a political group that focuses on drug decriminalization in Georgia, the country. Uh, Pata has extensively sought and used artistic methods to campaign for LGBTQ uh, human rights and the rights of displaced persons and the rights of people who use drugs, people who live with HIV, and access to treatment for hepatitis C in Georgia. Throughout those campaigns, Pata has used the dance floor as the main site of mobilizing people facing injustice and violence from their families and the state. Um, Pata was one of the main organizers of Revolution, a dance protest movement in response to aggressive drug raids in Tbilisi, Georgia. And Revolution brought over 10,000 people together for a two-day rave in front of parliament, which you'll get to see. Um, Pata is also a Center for Artistic Activism alumni, and I've heard about the story, and it is just not shared enough. So really happy to have Pata here. And finally, Jay Jordan. Jay has been labeled a domestic extremist by the UK police and a magician of rebellion by the French press. Um, Jay, formerly John Jordan, has spent three decades applying what they learned from theater and performance art to direct action. Together with Isabella Fermo, the uh, they co-facilitate the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination, which since 2004 has brought artists and activists together to co-design and deploy creative forms of disobedience. They like spaces betwixt and between, especially between art and activism, the masculine and feminine, resistance and proposition, party and protest. And they're performed in museums and international theater festivals, train people in squats, co-organize climate camps, choreograph carnivalesque riots, written a BBC radio play for today and an opera for one. Co-founder of the anti-capitalist rave and direct action collective Reclaim the Streets from 1995 to 2000. And in 2004, Jay co-launched the clandestine insurgent rebel clown army. Um, Jay also influenced a lot of the ideas that led to the Center for Artistic Activism and is like a point person for us um, going back for since the beginning. So. Again, real honor to have you here. Um, so Kate, I wanna start with you. Um, Shout Your Abortion does this thing where you're celebrating abortion and it seems to really lean into performing a sort of fearlessness, right? Um, whether or not you actually feel that, but encouraging people to, to perform it and, um, and to sort of not take on the stigma that might be put upon people but to be incredibly open about it. And um, I wanna know how you think, I mean, it seems to work, right? Um, in a lot of ways, how do you think it works? 
Yeah. So thank you for those images and for that introduction. Very exciting. I was so excited about the sparklers <laughs> in front of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, and I'm I'm a lawyer, not an artist. So in, in those types of visual images turn out, uh, it's always very exciting. And I kept insisting, I'm like, we got to get sparklers. We got to go to the National Mall. <laughs> um, and I think part of the reason it works is abortion is freedom. And that's actually very fun and joyful. Like it, it's a naturally uh, joyful thing to be able to control your own life and your own destiny. But that joy and that power and that control has been taken from us and has been stigmatized in the public square. And so giving by shouting our abortions and by giving other people that permission to have a lighthearted, like joyful approach to the topic that's so negatively stigmatized, it gives them permission to do the same. I remember Amelia Bono, our founder, uh, <laughs> was uh heard someone on the subway and they said uh, someone was talking about their abortion and yada yada and it's you know can't tell the family and it's so shameful and the other girl she was talking to was like girl we can shout our abortions now it's okay <laughs> and mm. so that message is very like replicable it's very easy for other people to catch joy from from someone else um and so i think the the approach of shout your abortion destigmatizes what is actually very naturally a joyful thing um and gives people permission to do what they already think you know like mm -hmm. i think it's it, the statistics is very high i i believe it's 98% um there was a study called the Turnaway Study, uh, which was a multi-year study of people who had been turned away from abortions versus people who had gotten them. Um, mm -hmm. And the people who had been turned away from abortion care, which means they eventually did have to have the pregnancy and, and birth, um, you know, express extreme amounts of regret, angst. Um, you know, there are, it's just like a really devastating study about right. you know they're they're exponentially they're exponentially less likely to express joy when their child smiles like it's just real depressing <laughs> and then yeah. you contrast that with people who had abortions and 98 percent of them never have any regrets and so that's that's already the natural inclination like these people don't regret this decision and so giving them a place to actually celebrate something that they fe they already feel grateful and relieved about um i think is very powerful yeah i i love that like so much of what the whole organization or movement is trying to communicate is right in the name you know, it's an instruction <laughs> in a way, but it also is like, you say it and it's like, oh, right. You know, um, it just does that anti-stigmatization -stigma almost in that those three words. Um, is What was the love prompt a good that imperative got statement. <laughs> What's that? Say that again. I love a good imperative statement. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious what the prompt was to get the whole thing started. Was it that subway so, ride or? Yeah. So Shout Your Abortion started in 2015 as a response to the federal government, the U.S. House of Representatives defunding Planned Parenthood. Uh, if you remember right. that whole you mm -hmm. know fake scandal about the, the, the um, disposal of the fetal remains and the fake videos that they made uh, infiltrating clinics. And as a result, Republicans in the House of Representatives tried to and did successfully vote to defund Planned Parenthood, one of the major providers of abortion care in the United States. And, and so, so much it was else. And, and yes, and so much else. Uh, but I very uh, affirmatively say abortion care because other doctors do pap smears. <laughs> other doctors yeah. do, uh, you know, all of these things that are very important and life giving uh, to so many communities, but uh, very few provide abortion care. And I think that's one of their, um, you know, proudest provision of services. And so because of that, uh, Amelia and uh, Lindy West and, and some others got together 
shared their abortion stories with no regret or shame. And then they added the hashtag shout your abortion to encourage other people to do the same. And I think it was a hundred thousand people in one day uh, used the hashtag shout your abortion. So it really wow. tapped into, like I said, the millions of women and pregnant people who've had abortions and never regretted it for one day. So this has been going for a while. And of course, we've had recent news that has brought this <laughs> into the forefront again. Um, can you talk a little bit about the event you did at the Supreme Court? Um, I know you had a, the, the, that was where the pop-up lemonade stand appeared. Is that the first place it showed up? Um, and you have the abortion pill information stand. Um, it's, and uh, it's not the most common approach. I love the, like the kissing booth thing. I've used it a ton of times. But um, what? Why did you all choose it? What? What was the strategy uh, behind this? So uh, on June twenty fourth of this year, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the uh, seminal decision Roe versus Wade, ending nationwide abortion access uh, and the legal right to have an abortion. So that's ending fifty years of precedent of everyone in the country and every state abortion being legal, uh, immediately 26 states took uh, action to ban abortion in their states. Uh, so in the very near term, over 50% of the states in the United States will likely completely ban abortion. Uh, and so as a response, you know, everyone in the movement is reeling mm -hmm. from this decision. Um, I went on the day of the decision, about 40 minutes after the decision, I live in DC, I went to the Supreme Court, and of course, we were prepared um, and I started passing out uh, posters and I started passing out the posters said like, fuck SCOTUS. Uh, they also said, I will aid and abet abortion. Like it was a very specific messaging. Um, and like, so I'm like, I'm holding out the posters and people are just grabbing them from me. Like I, I don't even mm -hmm. have time. I'm getting rid of hundreds of posters in a matter of minutes. Um, and then I ran out of posters and I started passing out these pillboxes. I've seen um, one of those. Yeah. So these pill boxes are just boxes and inside is information about how to get abortion pills in all 50 states. Um, abortion medication, abortion, even before the Dobbs decision was the number one uh, form of abortion. So it's this most common, uh, but most mm -hmm. people don't know about it until they need it. Um, and so I started passing out these abortion pills boxes and people were like recoiling. <laughs> like people were very, very reticent to take them. Um, I Even when I said, like, there aren't pills in the box, it's information about how to get them. Uh, I was very clear about that. And it was, it, as opposed to the posters, which people just took in droves, um, I had a very hard time getting rid of the abortion pills. And so there's a lot of stigma, even with very pro-choice people, with people who ran to the Supreme Court on the day of the decision, there's a lot of stigma about abortion pills and medication in general. And so I thought, you know, we need to, that's, you know, a, a, along with the leadership of Amelia, like we need to get people, this needs to be yeah. just destigmatized like pills are the answer because you can get pills in any state uh, no matter what the laws are of that state so we decided to focus our um you know and, uh, and the shout your abortion had already been doing it, it during the arguments they took pills on the steps of the supreme court um and so shout your portion had already zeroed in on this and and after this my personal experience of trying to get these pills this pill information into the hands of people I said, we need to do another action um, that's, you know, celebrating this information. So, and also mm -hmm. uh, I'm just obsessed. I wanted to do something on the 4th of July because I, I, I'm just obsessed with this idea that abortion is freedom. Um, mm -hmm. Abortion demonstrates freedom, represents freedom and is freedom. Um, and so we decided to do an action on the 4th of July in front of the Supreme Court, um, helping not, not, you know, again, this is a very depressing time specifically for people in the movement, but we decided to make it fun and joyful and to sort of mock the court. Um, the messaging again, fuck SCOTUS, we're doing it anyway. Um, and so we did a, we did an abortion, as you saw in the pictures, we did an abortion pills lemonade stand. So people had to go through a line and uh, be, we had volunteers and the volunteers uh, sort of, it was a teach in. So they taught them about medication abortion. Again, 
many people know nothing about medication abortion, um, which is very easy. It's just two types of pills and you do it at home uh, up to 12 weeks approximately. Uh, and so we did, we taught people about the pills and then they, in order to get the lemonade, they had to go through the teach it. And then we gave them lemonade and, a uh, abortion pill information and also a, a bag, like a tote bag. And the tote bag was amazing. This was Amelia's idea. It said, I went to the Supreme court and all I got were these abortion pills. <laughs> <laughs> so they got like amazing tote bags. Uh, that they could then. And then, of course, we encourage people to do their own lemonade stands. Um, I, we did a training the other day. I think there were 30 people in different places Great. who are now do their own lemonade stands in Buffalo and Florida and like all these different places. So the idea was to like model this joyful, exciting, classic American lemonade stand event and then have other people replicate it in other states. Yeah, I love, I mean, there's so many ways this makes that more friendly, you know, and, um, and I, a great thing about like an information booth is people know what it's for and will are comfortable coming up and asking a question, you know, it's like, it makes sense. So, um, yeah, great. I want to move on to, um, Pata and we'll come back to some questions around this stuff a little bit later, but, um, Pata, I remember you coming up to me in 2018 and saying, we used all these ideas in this big, uh, event and, in Georgia and started to tell me about it. And this whole movement started in a nightclub and then uh, turned into a two day rave in front of parliament in uh, Tbilisi in the capital of Georgia. And I mean, you you basically like got them to back down, which was incredible. And I and changed, I mean, I don't wanna give everything away, but changed a lot of how um, people perceived uh, drugs and drug policy in the country. Um, and I think it's another example of where these very serious spaces like parliament or the steps of parliament or the front of the Supreme court can sort of be destabilized. So can you kind of go back and tell us about what led to this big event? And, um, I know that there were like military police raids in the clubs that kicked these things off. Tell us about what happened. Um, Hello, Steve, and thanks for having me here. Uh, after that conversation we had in Amsterdam in 2018. And also, I want to thank you for the training we had in Barcelona in 2014, it was, I believe, uh, yeah. which helped me a lot to do things whichever I'm going to speak now. Uh, thank you again for that. Um, because uh, it's not uh, very often that this happens. Uh, it's valuable. Uh, 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 yes. And thank you again. Uh, so uh, in the first place, I would make it uh, clear that this was the, this revolution action was the only action which was not planned. It was a response to the raid, police raid to the club. Uh, and people who gathered there were not led by anybody. Um, they were kicked out from the club and police said, uh, you know, this uh, drug addicts and uh, queers and homos will go home, uh, will hide in their, you know, uh, closet. Uh, but happened the ad, um, totally reverse to that because um, what happened was, was that people started moving to the parliament without anyone asking them uh, to do this because all the leaders of the movement, all the um, uh, 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 all the um, manager management of the club were detained by the police, knowing that they uh, they could mobilize mobilize the crowds. So why uh, this happened was that uh, why this happened was that um, so we had this white noise movement in Georgia, which was uh, for um, uh, uh, for. Uh, for reforming a very draconic drug laws that Georgia had um, to imagine um, for, I don't know, for one pill of ecstasy, uh, you can go to jail from five, five to eight years, even not one pill, even the trace on the paper or, or, or empty syringe uh, of something. And uh, over one gram gets you to eight to 20 years in jail time or the lifetime in the jail. 
Uh, wow. It's uh, even worse than United States, I think. Uh, Georgia copied a lot from the U.S. Ju justice system. So we also copied this not very good part. And um, uh, so why the clubs and the movement, right? Um, because people going to the clubs were targeted by the police. Um, this was easy way to, to, you know, to identify people going to have fun. Everybody understands they might have something on them. And a one, uh, one um, uh, attempt to, to, to get high and dance can cost you a life, uh, basically, because it's not so easy to come back from there, you know? And, sure, sure. Uh, I, I was there for smoking one joint. Honestly, I spent time in jail. And, uh, uh, and uh, I don't know, it was for my activism or something that, uh, that uh, uh, helped me out from the prison. Uh, but that was the reason why I joined this movement uh, for uh, sure. reforming drug policies. And so people going to the clubs, 18 years old and like 20, 25 year old, losing total perspective of life for nothing. We're not saying that the drugs are good for you, but, uh, but we say like uh, you should not abuse, uh, you should not harm yourself if you can't stop using drugs. And that's the approach, the harm reduction approach, which really works uh, against prohibitionist uh, approach. Um, so uh, so uh, what happened was that uh, we had one very good victory in the constitutional court and we wanted to give this uh, effect of this victory to the people. We wanted to organize a discussion where we wanted to invite people to this sterile NGO environment and people would not come there. I mean, they don't feel safe there. And what we did, I had, uh, I was tripping in the club and I saw this energy uh, of people conflicting with the, uh, with the sound of music. So mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted to turn the things around in a way that people uh, escaping their sad realities, queer people, I don't know, women, uh, young people, old people, everybody escaping mm -hmm. their sad realities in the club, in the place of escapism. Um, and, you know, uh, going back again to their realities, you know, nothing changes. So I said something wrong about this. We need to do something about this. So what we did was that, you know, this momentum where you feel very good in the club, and you are happy with other people, uh, not together with them, but standing by them and feeling yeah. this joy and happiness. Uh, what if this go, uh, transfers into the solidarity uh, for each other and everybody goes out to the streets wherever is the need to help one of us, even one of us. So all of us would leave the dance floor when, uh, whenever we got the call that one of our friends on his way or her way to the club, was detained by the police, literally abducted because none of the family members were able to find out where their uh, 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 relative is. Uh, they had no right to call their uh, parents or anybody. So there are two yeah. drug testing facilities in the city and we had the volunteers living nearby. We would call them and ask, can you check there are the glass buildings in the police, there was a part of a, a police transparency re, uh, reform. And we benefited from that in a way that we were looking inside to see wh which one has this person. And we would go there, turn up the techno music, start dancing in front of the police station. And before uh, that, everybody would be very, very scared to do that even for their friends. So we had sure. to do that for their friends. And uh, uh, and then so we would you go have been... back with the with the um, with this uh, trophy, uh, our friend is free, uh, <laughs> back to the dance floor, you know, and and the slogan "We dance together, we fight together" came from there. We would not use it uh, because we thought it's not serious. But when they stormed the dance floor with the machine guns and the masks of the riot police, uh, peaceful people in the club, can you imagine? You are in a club dancing, loving somebody, yeah. embracing somebody. Uh, very good artists. We have a very good artists. 
uh, every weekend. So, uh, and this police comes in and they say, please leave the dance floor now. And, you know, I, when I saw the pictures of this happening, I felt like raped, honestly. Uh, I felt like my home was raped. Uh, by this right. gunman inside the, there, you know. Uh, so and and the and the television was showing videos how police is grabbing uh, girls, trans people, like they're I don't know, uh, total uh, total outcast of the uh, society, so that nobody would stand for them. But they were deeply mistaken because. Uh, I don't know. It was amazing. Uh, uh, these people, the leaders were still in the jail where people started gathering in front of the parliament. Police attempted to, um, to not let them, uh, 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 assemble there, but they still did it. And, uh, while waiting for the leaders from their way from the jail to join the protest action, they just started music. Uh, those DJs who came to Tbilisi specifically for Tbilisi crowd to play the set uh, intended for Tbilisi crowd, they wanted to play this set and they played this set in front of the parliament. I think so, we have video uh, of this. Before that, uh, yes. Can we show the video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has a little bit of everything. Yeah. So those so, outdoor uh, shots are little... right in front of Parliament, right? Exactly. So uh, this action, you know, without uh, before people uh, like these leaders came uh, to speak to the media and everything, some community leaders spoke to the media. They said, "We demand the resignation of the government." You know, <laughs> the uh, dancers demand the resignation of the government. <laughs> Uh, aim high, aim high. Drug, these, uh, you know, junkies and homos and what the hell is going on there? And um, and um, so they started, they said this and nothing else they had to say. And they just started dancing. And when the leaders arrived and saw what was going on there, they also spoke a few words, said thank you. And... Uh, uh, mostly nobody was speaking. Very uh, few moments uh, somebody was speaking, mostly technical announcements, etc. So this was going on two days and nights. And um, what happened was that the counter demonstration started assembling across the police line of uh, ah. extreme right. Um, I don't know. I don't want to label them as well because they are our uh, brothers because they don't have sisters with them, you know, only boys. <laughs> Uh, aggressive uh, masculinity, you know, and sure. uh, some of them are cute, though. But um, <laughs> uh, but no, I'm sure maybe they are standing there because we didn't dance with them uh, that <laughs> in some years. No, I don't know. Maybe it's our fault that they are standing on the other side. I'm I'm not sure, <laughs> honestly. So uh, all these people <laughs> dancing there were not hating anyone. So those people yeah. came and they were demanding us to leave. Because this yeah. was a disgust, it was the insult of the this sacred area. Because this area, this uh, square, remembers the massacre by Soviet army for Georgia's strife for independence in ninety one, etc., etc. So yeah. it was kind of you know all these homos rave uh, in front of Parliament where Georgian blood was spilled. You know, so sure, sure. Uh, so exactly. So. And um, people, uh, um, my grandma generation thought that techno is like a very tough, bad music, uh, you know, not for us. But they joined us. They joined us, honestly. Uh, grandmas, grandpas were there dancing. They're saying, oh, this is such a nice music, actually. It <laughs> unites people so nicely. And honestly, what government got was, and the society on this uh this conservative society who pushed us, already pushed us underground, 
We were underground sure. in the club, in the closed club, in our, you know, and they pushed us out. So that's what they got. We're back, we are here, and now you look at us. And this ray was free of charge. It was my uh, dream because sometimes these techno parties get not so democratic, not so accessible for everybody. Right, right. And uh, it was so nice, honestly. And actually, when we reclaimed the club uh, a week later, uh, 10 days later, uh, we invited these people to join us in the uh, dance, political dance party, actually. It was free of charge, free, free of any face control, nothing. Everybody were there. 5,000 people it was very good. And that's great. Yeah, so I, I want to get yeah, to the before, uh, before, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say just one thing from white noise movement. This is this movement of uh, volunteer volunteers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this movement is not even registered. It's uh, not non-existent. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, white noise. When you one example, when you see the empty screen and it's shh, this white and black dots, this white noise is mm -hmm. uh, if uh, someone doesn't know. Uh, terms from the sound engineering uh, and this uh, sound uh, uh, composed of white and black particulars which don't do anything on their own but when they come together they are able to generate this terrible sound which uh, signals you to do something about it it won't go off if you don't do anything about it so this was the idea about the movement because uh, none of us were paid there you know we had our lives we had the best uh, camera people, best, uh, I don't know, sound people, everybody. They joined uh, 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 and uh, made this very aesthetic, very aesthetic protest communication language, which changed, totally changed the surface in Georgian uh, protest culture. Uh, uh, just saying uh, one word before we, uh, before I ha will have opportunity to say more about that and show more about that. I know it comes later. But to say, to, to make it clear why people went to parliament by themselves was that we used already clubs before that as the hotbeds for mobilization of people. For instance, we would have a, a huge 10,000 people rallies on Saturday or Sunday on weekends so that people can join, uh, uh, not being in the offices, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the party is on Friday. So how do we have the same people in the both places? So what we did was that, you know, you get sometimes stamped here on the wrist uh, uh, in the club if you want to re-enter. Uh, so we yeah. asked all the clubs to make the special stamp, which would say Parliament 7 p.m., nothing else. And uh, they would stamp and they would say what it means when, uh, in the entry that tomorrow there is the white noise movement protest action in front of Parliament which starts 7 p.m., so go home early tonight. And uh, <laughs> the first thing person would uh, see, uh, wake up and see Parliament 7 p.m. Oh, I should go yeah. there. Because, you know, after a long night, it's not hard, it's not hard to forget. Also, we sure, make sure. posters in the toilets when people do drugs, uh, or a bigger font because people have the fizzy vision, you know. And also, when you do this, uh, everything get, uh, which gets associated with taking drugs, you remember everything there. Everything's very special for you. So these uh, posters <laughs> there, and also the control uh, was that in the garderobe, when you were leaving, there was the projection countdown how many hours you have to rest to go to the protest action. So this Great. is how we developed this uh, rave, uh, uh, rave squad going for any kind of action, for women, for metro workers, for mine workers, everybody. Wow. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So I yeah, now I shut up. I don't yeah, want to take uh, so much time. Sorry. That's okay. No, I, I like how you figured out how to organize like what <laughs> you know, what some people might consider like very difficult people to gather together and, and like motivate when they're hungover, but you figured it out. Um, but yeah, and there, and we'll come back to this, but I think it's a great way to lead into to Jay. Um, and, and especially after what Pata said, you know, it seems like organizing dance and club goers to political ends is just like common sense. But I think that you help make that part of common sense um, uh, through Reclaim the Streets. Um, and I think prior to Reclaim the Streets, there weren't as many references 
that one could pull from on how to um, uh, turn a, a protest into a party or maybe ones that weren't so visible and clearly, you know, uh, making that connection. Um, I, so the first question I have for you is like, did this seem like common sense at the time? Were you like, of course we would do this? Or was it um, an odd mix or something you had to convince people of? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think a lot of movements come out of moments of repression. I mean, both Kate and uh, Pat have talked about that. Uh, yeah. You know, when they hit us, we come together better sometimes. And then we have a joint enemy. And it's also also very useful to have a joint enemy. Um, and so basically Reclaim the Streets came out of, uh, actually there was a kind of pre-Reclaim the Streets, which came out of the U.S. Earth First movement, folk from the U.S. Earth First movement, radical ecology movement, direct action movement, came to the U.K. And the kind of urban version of what that led to was a group called Reclaim Streets, which is very much about the streets are the commons. Uh, we need to reclaim them for uh, people away from the car. So it was kind of an anti-car movement doing kind of creative actions, but there was no rave or dance or whatever. And then what happened, it was put on pause because there was a huge anti-roads movement that came up, uh, a kind of direct action anti-roads movement, people living in trees, people squatting uh, uh, buildings that were going to be knocked down for roads. And that was a very, very successful movement. Uh, 700 roads in the UK were cancelled due to that. Um, wow. And then Reclaim Streets came back out of that. Uh, it came out because actually a load of us who kind of reformed Reclaim Streets afterwards, we'd been in this, there was this road where we'd squatted 45 houses that were going to be part of the 350 houses that were going to be destroyed. And for six months, we had a whole street to ourselves. It was a kind of L, uh, kind of this shaped street. So if you imagine there was a main street here, and it was this shape, but we put a barricade there and a barricade there. And then we had the whole street to ourselves. So we had like 45 houses squatted and that garden squatted. And I think the experience of having the street without cars totally, totally inspired us to go, well, actually, let's, instead of being reactive, instead of waiting, you know, in, in the anti-rose movement, you were like, oh, there's a road planning here. We're going to mm -hmm. squat everything, get in the way, cause a lot of money, cause a lot of chaos, make it expensive for them to evict us, and that's going to make them less likely to, to build roads. And here it was, well, let's be more proactive. Let's not just wait for them to come. Let's be proactive. Let's reclaim the streets and say we need to be proactive and turn these streets back into commons. Um, but during, uh, so in 19, this is in the, the early 90s, um, and in 1994, the British government does one of the first things in the history of, of I, think, I think, music in that they actually uh, employ a musicologist to basically go to Parliament to write law. Uh, and they basically write a law against rave music because there'd been a huge free party scene, uh, yeah. a massive free party scene uh, just before. And uh, so they basically say it's music defined by repetitive beats. And more than 10 people dancing to a sound system outside is illegal. Of course, this makes music rave go back inside, get, be paid for, etc., become something for the elite and the rich rather than, than anyone. Um, and so this law comes in, but it's part of a thing called the Criminal Justice Act, which basically brings to, it also criminalizes direct action. So the anti-roads mm. movement, you know, you put your bodies in the way of the bulldozers. That was not a criminal act before 94. Uh, the road builders would have to take you to court. So you, you'd go to court if you said fuck to the police, because that would be swearing, but you couldn't go to court for actually uh, blocking the bulldozer. And in 1994, they actually made that kind of work, so made putting your body, stopping work, a criminal act. So it criminalized direct action, criminalized rave. What happens? There's loads of a movement arises, and the ravers and the direct action people meet in a political context rather than just raving. Uh, and that's kind of where this idea of let's actually bring a sound system into public space to reclaim it um, mm -hmm. and create a party. Um, I mean, was it common sense? I mean, it, it, it emerged. I mean, things emerge, you know. I mean, we were, we were influenced by lots of things. I mean, uh, many, many of us were influenced by kind of the artistic avant-garde, so Dada, situationism, and so on. Situationists always said that, you know, insurrection, especially the Paris Commune, insurrections, revolutions, felt like carnival. 
And because the world was turned upside down, there was conviviality, you know, and, and, and all the hierarchies got turned on their heads. Men became women, humans became animals, slaves became kings, etc. And in Reclaimed Streets, we were like, well, let's turn that in its, uh, let's hack that in itself. So instead of waiting for the insurrection to feel like a carnival, let's create carnivals that feel like insurrections. Mm -hmm. So... so Go on. Go on, Steve. Okay. No, I mean, I can go into the whole history, but I don't know. Well, if this is the right yeah, idea. yeah, yeah. I was going to say um, uh, this, that is sort of what you're doing now, right? With the carnivals against capital. Um, like, and, and of course, that's what Reclaim the Streets did, but it sort of developed into uh, both the Laboratory for Insurrectionary Imagination, right? Is that timeline right? And then uh, the carnivals against capital? No, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Time doesn't have to be linear. I mean, what happened? So Reclaim Street starts to do these street parties. The first one, uh, you know, quite small, uh, but very, very creative. The first one, we, we, it's a, a street where um, uh, everyone goes on Sunday. It's like a big market. It's Camden, uh, and basically, but it's full of cars all the time. Um, and basically, for that street party, we would meet in a squat. Uh, then people go into the underground and uh, the police radios didn't work in the underground in those days. Um, uh. And so a few people would know where the street party was happening. The crowd would be in, on the underground and then it would emerge like a mole at the right place to, to do the street party. And so on the first street party, we had these two cars going up the street and uh, these two cars crashed into each other and people got out of the cars and with road rage started to get out hammers and, and, and paint and started smashing each other's cars up. And everyone in shopping is looking at these two cars being smashed up and the people are going, yeah, you bashed my car, you know, you don't know how to like, drive. You know? And then as that was happening, 500 people turned out of the, came out of the, 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 the metro um, and took the street and they were our cars and it was a, a, a way of sure. deviating and, and blocking the road and so on. And that, the system, it was very simple, and that's why it became very popular. It was, you know, bring a sound system, you invite people, you never ask permission, it's disobedience, you don't ask permission, and you take the space. Um, and so it started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and and that's where it, it kind of started to link with uh, the uh, um, other movements of people who were not like us. I mean, we were ravers, anarchists, communists, ecologists, queers, artists. And we managed to work with people who were completely different from, from us, um, partly through, I think, the power of the imagination and the power of saying, actually, changing the world can be pleasurable. Changing the world has to be pleasurable. You know, if changing the world is boring, what are we going to do? You know, it's, it's not going right. to work. There has to be a deep, deep embodied pleasure in changing the world. Um, and I'm curious, just I'm going to make a little leap here, but... Did you hear about the colorful revolution in, in Skopje, Macedonia? Uh, in what 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 period was that? In nineties? No, it, no, no, no. It was like much more recent. But um, when you said you know cars and the paint, like it, it just like I I have a feeling that there's some sort of line to be drawn. I don't know how it zigs and zags through, you know, different people. But um, in Skopje, they had this very repressive government and. Um, I think it was like every Thursday they would come out and the the whole downtown, the government had made very white, like these white kind of buildings, you know? And um, so they would pour paint onto the street and then drive cars and like paint the street with the cars and then shoot these paint, um, paint water balloons onto the white buildings and just splatter them with color. And it, it was a huge party, you know, like they turned it into a huge party and it actually like helped S similar to Pata, like really um, uh, in that case, you know, led to that government leaving. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the uh, I'm sorry, tell us about the carnivals against capital. <laughs> Well, I was going to talk about really uh, 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 how we got to work with people who weren't like us. Um, ah, yeah. So I think it's an interesting lesson for people thinking about creative forms of act activism. Uh, so we started to get kind of bigger, bigger street parties, started being street parties in different cities in the UK. 
Um, and then uh, we decided this time we'll take a motorway. We've taken streets. Why don't we just take right. a motorway? So at one point we had 8,000 people on a motorway. And during those 8,000 people on a motorway, we had these big dresses that were kind of carnival dresses. So if you imagine people are about this high and you've got this big carnival dress. And they're going up and down the motorway. And every now and then stop near the sound system. Like when you're doing this, I just want to point out they're they're like on a ladder or still to a ladder and like three stories up, right? Uh, yeah, well, three is a bit big, but I mean, you know, it's like fish, you know. But it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and so uh, they and they every now and then they stop uh, by a sound system, and actually under the skirts are people with jackhammers drilling holes into the tarmac and planting trees. And in a way, you know, this was for us, you know, Reclaim Streets was so much about prefigurative politics. You know, you show the world you want. You don't just say no. You say yes yeah. and no at the same time. So you block the road. You're saying, no, we don't want the cars. But actually, look, this is what the road can look like if it's got pleasure and people and bodies in it and community. Uh, and so here we were saying, actually, and the flyers we handed out that day said under the tarmac, the forest. Um, and um, so those, uh, that what happened is, uh, of course, it's a symbolic act because the road gets re resurfaced afterwards. But we got a call from um, uh, the Liverpool dockers who were like totally, you know, they were traditional Marxist dockers. They were not ravers, queers, artists, activists, ecologists, anarchists. Mm -hmm. uh, and they started working with us because they saw the audacity and the imagination in the act. And I think mm. audacity and imagination crosses boundaries. It crosses class boundaries. It crosses uh, all kind of um, cultural differences. Um, and we started working with them. And that led to a kind of the early days of the alter globalization movement uh, through then working with a thing called People's Global Action, which was um, a uh, network ranging from the Zapatistas to uh, landless peasants in, 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 in Brazil. Um, and uh, it was a huge network saying, we're going to use direct action against the big institutions, IMF, World Bank, uh, WTO. And we called for a global street party uh, in 1998, in the spring 1988. In, on the 16th of May, it was the same day that in the Paris Commune, the Federation of Artists pulled down the Vendome column. Um, and on the 16th of May, uh, 1998, there were 70 street parties all over the world in different countries. And the next year 99 we called for the carnival against capitalism and that was an idea of really saying we will replace the sound of profit with the sound of pleasure um and we'll do that in financial districts while the g8 are meeting in cologne and that again was uh, about 50 different countries there were uh, uh um, carnivals against capitalism um i can go into the details of that with another question I, otherwise I'll, i'm I'll just curious if you stories. could say quickly like how but, did well, you actually sorry just to finish the, the carnival against capitalism is just before seattle so the people who are organizing seattle were super in, influenced and inspired by that it's 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 in june 1999 seattle happens in november so it was really a kind of warm-up for the coming out party of the anti-globalization movement sorry sure sorry. sure no no uh um i was gonna say you know you you just kind of said and then these things happened all over the world like how did you, how did that happen? How did you get the parties happening well, all over the world? Mm. Well, uh, you know, often in the laboratory of intellectual imagination, we talk about the power of the edge uh, mm -hmm. and the power that is in, in all edges. I mean, in ecosystems, you know, the edge between the forest and the, and the meadow is the most powerful. There's most different species, therefore the most kind of energy of evolution, same by the sea. That's where life, life began on the edge of the sea and the land. And, and the, we were in a kind of edge epoch between internet organizing and non-internet organizing. So it's 94, internet is invented, 94 starts to be used. So actually we were really, had a lot of people who'd done a lot of organizing, which was face-to-face, -face, posters, meeting, blah, 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 no, and started to use the internet. And I think that's what enabled us to be kind of, so, so we would, you know, both in the offices organizing, we'd do piles of flyers, you know, in envelopes that would be sent out to India and, and everywhere. And at the same time, mm. we were using beginning to use the internet. So it was this kind of edge period. And I think that, uh, and at the time, the internet was totally decentralized. We thought suddenly here was, you know, we were I was coming, from, you know, come, coming from kind of anarchist backgrounds. We were like, my goodness, here is this anarchist decentralized thing. This is the, the at last, we have decentralized forms of organization. And we're winning. 
we didn't realize yeah. that Facebook and Twitter and Weeble would be able to centralize something that seemed to be uncentralizable. <laughs> yeah, well, if you could have predicted that, I think you would be in a very different position now. But um, <laughs> um, Kate, I wanted to go back to you thinking about how you know th these movements spread and shout your abortion spread very quickly. Um, you know, you said like a hundred thousand people in a day use the hashtag. Um, so if that was like just sort of a spontaneous thing, like sometimes those things just happen, you can't reproduce it. But if that's the case, how do you harness that? How do you turn that into a movement? Or if it was like, if there was some push that you did behind it, how did that work? Yeah, I think this is, you know, perfect question coming off of what Jay uh, is talking about, which is uh, the invention of the internet and how like how hashtags become actual movements um, and how they harness that power for culture shift, but also um, policy change. I think, you know, I'm a lawyer and also an activist. And so those are like usually pretty different worlds. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think part of the way that the momentum behind Shout Your Abortion uh, became like its actual own movement is there was a little bit of a vacuum in the reproductive rights and justice movement when it came to joy and expression. And, you know, there was, there's like several organizations, there's Planned Parenthood, there's NARAL, there's, you know, the Center for Reproductive yeah. Rights, there's like nonprofit organizations and service providers um, but there is, there wasn't at the time and, and in large part still isn't this like widespread movement, um, to, to engage like regular people, like the abortion mm -hmm. rights movement sometimes feels very siloed. Um, and so I think what happened with shout your abortion, the hashtag is that like regular people who are the people who get abortions, <laughs> Um, suddenly like had an inroad to tell their story that was untethered to like a specific organization or political candidate or, you know, it was just, I'm telling my story. Um, and it's like joyful and I'm proud of it. And, you know, all these, and, and that's that collective experience is what tied uh, the, the, the group together. And I think that has continued with Shout Your Abortion, you know, for the for the action that we did on July 4th, um, you know, all of the volunteers are people who have either had abortions or loved and supported someone who had an abortion, a.k.a. everyone uh, yeah, in, the, yeah. in the world uh, knows someone who has had an abortion. Um, but it became this group of people who who were galvanized by that, you know, that performance or that um, expression or that liberation of that hashtag. And then we're like, I want to do this in real life in, in person. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting and ongoing pro project. Honestly, I think from taking shout your abortion from a hashtag to like a, a, a nationwide movement is part of the project we're engaged in currently. Uh, for the Dobbs response, we uh, tried to organize a, an action in every state in the United States um, because obviously we knew what was going to happen. The decision was leaked in advance. Um, and so we, it was like really grassroots. Like we just said like, who knows someone in Kansas? Who knows some, you know, like it was, who knows who knows who? It was this, um, like Jay was talking about, a lot of it actually was just through existing networks, um, not necessarily advertising on, on social media, but like building those actual in-person connections. Um, I think we managed to have in the 40s, it wasn't all 50 states, but we had actions uh, in most states. And these were in-person on the ground actions, um, many of whom we like shipped posters to or supported or provided funds so they could like print in Idaho, um, which is, you know, one of the worst states in the U.S. for many things, including white supremacy and uh, oppression of women. Uh, they in downtown Boise, Idaho, they had these huge banners that they dropped from a building that said, I will aid and abet abortion. Um, wow. And so like a very affirmative message in a very repressive place. 
um, and what we we connected with them and supported them. Um, so yeah, I think I think we're in that process, like you're talking about, of cre- taking the hashtag and creating like individual communities in lots of places. Um, mm-hmm. And and actually, the trajectory of the jet, the mainstream reproductive rights movement is going in the other direction. So, for example, NARAL, um, which is one of the main organizations, used to have a chapter in every state. And last year, they divested from that structure. And all of those organizations were kind of like left out to dry and had to like individually incorporate um, and receive mm-hmm. no funding from the national structure. And so like a lot of organizations are divesting from state action and organizing and Shout Your Abortion is investing um, because for many obvious reasons, uh, states are where the worst laws happen uh, when it comes to abortion. So, yeah, I, I, that's a long answer. But the, the short answer is we're in that process of uh, yeah. cementing what was primarily online and making it yeah. in person. One of the things that I'm. I didn't think about before, but like, uh, Jay, you said it really well, you know, like when people are being pushed or something, then then they see a common enemy and it unites them. Um, And so when you have new people in a movement and you have new, uh, maybe people that aren't as experienced, and it's like this party thing, right? Where you're not, it's not strictly organized. You're not giving them these instructions about how to behave and a, a schedule and agenda of where, when to be where, and, you know, there's a meeting and people speak at this point, you know, there's a lot of latitude in how those people can participate. And there's a, a flexus artist named Dick Higgins who talks about rules of a game. And so you create the rules of a game and then people play within it. Right. And so the rules of, a game don't dictate the winner or the loser. The rules of the game don't make it a dramatic or exciting thing to watch or participate in. The players do. The rules enable that to happen. So I'm kind of curious how you put boundaries on this so that it still has the political direction, it still has impact without stifling the autonomy and the agency of the people within it. Um, Kate, do you want to start or Jay? Sure. I, I want to know what Jay has to say because um, I'm very interested. I, I'll say, and, and there are like many good examples of that in activism in the history of the U.S. One of them is ACT UP. Um, ACT UP is an AIDS uh, organization, AIDS rights organization. Um, I'm currently reading uh, a book about ACT UP, uh, Let the Record yeah. Show. And it's such a good book. And I think that they really modeled that um, that structure of like everyone has one cause, but we're kind of all like tumbling together and doing the same thing. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do with Shout Your Abortion is like instead of, for example, when I talked about the local actions that we're doing, I didn't go into those states and say like, oh, OK, in Idaho, you should do this and you should do this and you should do this. Um, Mm -hmm. What I did is I met with the activists in Idaho and said, what, you know, Idaho, (laughs) because you live there. Um, What, what are you going to do? How can we support you? Um, What materials do you need? Uh, You know, is there, do you need ideas? Do you need support? Um, And so kind of, instead of trying to take over, like you said, and, and, and have like a really defined structure, it was just like, okay, the day of the decision something needs to happen in every place. <laughs> yeah, And yeah. like, what does that mean to be? Um, I would say the only thing that we really tried to uh, lend to the cause was like a very affirmative message uh, about that we will continue to provide abortions and support abortion care no matter what. So that mm-hmm. was like the overarching cause and, and the aid and abet abortion messaging specifically was Shout Your Abortions messaging. Um, but like... Uh, Pato was saying we started seeing it other places. <laughs> yeah, you know, like see it on a billboard, we'd see it on a sign, and we're like, oh, we didn't make those. You know, it just started infiltrating the culture, um, and that was the point, obviously. So I think um, the best way, it, it, the best way, is a combination, like a, a a good solid vision with like very specific messaging, but 
ha- letting everyone adapt it to their own circumstances and and specifically in the U.S. location. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of mentioned a date message. There's a date. There's a message. Um, the maybe a little bit of tone or or yeah, this affirmative thing. Um, and it's you know maybe that's kind of all it took. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I, I mean. mean- <laughs> It's also it's also difficult because you're trying to train active like activism and organizing is a specific skill. It's sure, like yeah. people people think just like anyone can be an activist. Um and it's like that's true, but it does take skill. <laughs> like it it yeah, takes yeah. very you can be better. It's like, uh it t- you have to to be an organizer, you have to be organized um you have to you know you have to be able to have certain communication skills you have to have support and so i think um yes like just giving people a message and letting them uh take it on in creative ways is very important but in order to build a sustainable movement you also have to train people you have to give them skills you have to you have to make community like community is the number one and most important thing for a sustainable movement, in my opinion, um, mm-hmm. and is sorely, sorely lacking in the feminist movement in the U S for many reasons that we could have a like whole nother panel about. <laughs> um, but I think in addition to community is like support and training and like seeing, ac- seeing organizing as an actual skill. Um, and, and that I think is, is very important, like giving people the tools they need, not trying to control them, um, but trying to train them and educate them and like support them. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's again, like another ongoing, it it doesn't just happen. Like (laughs) these actions are huge, like, you know, event management situations and like, uh, project management. It's, it's, it's a very specific skill. It doesn't just happen. You don't just have a rave with 10,000 people with no planning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, I think for me, the, the community aspect is investing in the skills of the people. Well, I could talk about what the center for artistic activism does and what the library story of insurrectionary imagination does. Um, you know, cause that's sort of part of why we exist, but, um, Jay, I know you think about like how you create the kind of structure for this to go well um, and autonomy versus boundaries. Like, what do you think about all that? It's a hugely complex question that it has no single answer because it's it very situation and context specific. Uh, I mean, Reclaim Streets was a kind of chaotic childlike explosion of possibilities uh, where you had some very good organizers who were like nearly full time. You then had a weekly meeting and then you just called for the thing. And a lot of the organizing was, you know, how to get the sound system there, how to get the comms out and stuff like that. But once it happened, to be honest, we kind of let go. And that was kind of what the state hated. Uh, the state wanted us to have, you know, all the health and safety. I mean, health and safety, no, you know, there was no health and safety. <laughs> there was like, it was like, you bring the sound system in and you invite people to the party and you take the street. Um, and I think the reason we were infiltrated, and that's a whole uh, long other story so much, but was because we, in a way, we, we said like, this isn't a carnival. This isn't just uh, a space where people are going to get let go of steam and then go back to work as normal. Yeah which is what the aim of carnival is often is, you know, in, to enable business as usual, just to let off steam, you know, same with clubbing, you know, you club, you take FEs in the, in the weekend and then you go back to work. And this was like, no, actually, you know, this is like, uh, we're going to have carnivals with no fixed ends. And what happens at the end? Normally a riot. And that's actually what happened with a lot of the ends of reclaimed streets, which of course caused lots of, you know, uh, uh, discussions and debates. But to be honest, that was, was what gave us our edge because we, we weren't a clearly nonviolent, um, movement. Uh, but we were using pleasure and joy and carnival and masks and costumes. And, and so th- we, we confused the fuck out of the state. Actually, they didn't know. And then we went for capital and then we went for, then something we had 8,000 people with 4,000 masks dancing in front of this financial, dis- in the financial district on a Friday and getting into the building. And they, they had, they just didn't know what was going on. Uh, because we just didn't fit the 
the, 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 you know, the march to A to B, which can be the most boring thing anyone has ever experienced in their life. Um, I can and just so, imagine someone saying, who's in charge? Who's in charge? <laughs> I want to talk to the person in charge. <laughs> uh, and so, but I mean, I, I think we, I have learned a lot from that. In, and, and, and I think in, in the laboratory of insurrection imagination, and I, well, I think that chaos was good and it was needed that moment in history because it really, you know, we got the front page of the Financial Times with anti-capitalist besieged city of London. We got the word anti-capitalism out there. We got the systemic critique. We got the link between ecology and capital out there as that was the message we were trying to say, you know, we haven't got an environmental problem. We've got a capitalism problem. Um, and, um, and, and, but, you know, the movement wasn't resilient. It, 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 it was quick. And, and I think what we learned in the laboratory of insurrection imagination in terms of frames is, so the laboratory insurrection imagination brings artists and activists together to co-create and design forms of disobedience because we think artists have a lot of creativity, look outside the box, but tend to have no courage, big egos, and are more interested in their career than world transformation generally. This is generalization. Activists tend to have more courage, more social engagement, more link between their everyday life and their politics, but lack imagination. So it's the same, you know, same marches, the same blockades or whatever. And what we have found is doing a kind of frame. So for example, I think one, one project looks is good at explaining this question is, it was called Put the Fun Between Your Legs become the bike block. Uh, and basically, we uh, recycled hundreds of bikes. So no, so we put out a call, and the call was, what, how can a bike be a tool of disobedience? And it was for the uh, Copenhagen UN Climate Summit in 2009, yeah. which was a big deal. Uh, yeah. It was really where the governments of the world were p perhaps going to do something about the, the climate breakdown. And so the thing was, okay, that, uh, how do we turn bikes into tools of disobedience? And we created the material base of it. So we basically collected hundreds of abandoned bikes because there are abandoned bikes all over Copenhagen, which is why we did the, this project. Uh, and we squatted buildings. Well, we had a squat to, to do it in. Uh, I mean, there's a whole other story around the relationship between the art world in that project, but we haven't got time for that. Um, and uh, people arrived with the material, with the welders and everything there, the bikes. And then we taught consensus decision making. And then we just had assemblies. And then we went, go, work in groups, da, da, da. So we just created the frame. And then everything yeah. else emerged out of the working together. But there was the frame and the material base there for people. And that's kind of what the lab has, in its better, mo better moments, tried to do. Yeah, I think I, I'm both of you talked about like kind of at a point letting go or sort of like you create the structure and then um, let it happen. And um, I think especially when we want to make ensure success, there's a tendency to kind of try to manage it a little bit more, but um, there's a lot to be said for let it's a being a good collaborator, you know, it's like letting people do what they do well and giving them the space to come up with an idea that's maybe different from yours and might even be better. Um, I'm going to say two things. One is that um, we have some audience questions coming in. Um, we do have some time for that. We're going to end in about 15 minutes, I think. So if you have questions, start asking them and I'll try to relay them. And Pata, I wanted to come back to you. That was number two. <laughs> How did... No, because, uh, you know, this may happen again uh, because I have a problem with the charger. Sorry to talk about <laughs> this technical thing, but this yes. is what happens. So I don't know. I, I want yes. to finish as soon as I pos as possible because I may go back Okay, yeah. Again. Tell us about so, uh, how this know, moved to Berlin. No, it was so. First, it spread. Uh, it uh, uh, it uh, gave other movements the same perspective. Uh, in like uh, after a week, it was the um, uh, International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia. Uh, then uh, there were some other related events uh, uh, and non-related events. But the thing was that everybody uh, decided to aim as high as we did. So all of them would, uh, all the, uh, how can I say, all the, unhappinesses or grievances what were set in the society uh, st started uh, having this big uh, uh, huge uh, uh, avenue 
to to un, un, uh, un, uncover itself. So this led to the change of the government yeah. actually. And uh, in this, uh, how this uh, action itself ended, I started that, uh, you know, there was a counter protest and government was telling us that they would start using uh, a force against the counter protest if we won't go home. So they wanted us to stop our protest so that they are not unhappy with our protest and they don't use a police force against them. Uh, and we said, okay, you know, we understand that you want to uh, play with us, but uh, we see we feel more responsibility than you do, and we don't want anybody go through the same thing what we did two yeah. days ago mm -hmm. ourselves. So we go home in peace, and uh, and you promise to solve the problems we are facing here. And uh, the uh, police minister, uh, first time in the history. Uh, came to this crowd and apologized. He said, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, uh, this was um, after we, we were discussing, uh, was this uh, revolution a success at all? Uh, was this uh, apology a real apology? Because after that, they shut all the doors for the uh -huh. negotiation. And we thought we lost. But what happened was that they changed the practice. They changed practice. They stopped uh, this uh, per perceiving people in the streets. They were doing 60,000 urine testing episodes during a year. Georgia is a small country. And with these our uh, actions, and I have uh, materials there to show uh, the posters and the pictures, I don't know, um, which shows and demonstrates uh, what we were doing, actually. Yeah, we might be able to get it's it the up. the right but... time now because this discussion is moving and I feel that this momentum is lost <laughs> now. I don't know. No, I it. think if we can get them up, we'll get them up there. But I know that like you basically got the them to change the practice of drug policy there, right? And and uh Yeah, we even got the we even got uh, uh marijuana legalized. It's incredible. Like smoking, yeah. like yeah, Which I is mean, what you went to jail uh, for. Uh, from, zero, from zero to hero, all of a sudden. No, actually, there was 70% of a public opinion against liberalizing drug policies when we started in 2016, beginning of 2016. At the end of 2016, 70% was for the wow. liberalization. Yeah. So that was the shift which we achieved through the materials I'm trying to... Well, do. I'll make sure that those get seen, okay. if not live in this video. Um, okay. Yes. And about the, about the, about the uh, how can I say, the effect which it had, then it spread to Berlin, uh, because in Berlin they said... Because before this happened in Felici, clubs were, you know, they were okay with the police. They would even make a deal that they organized raid once in a while to please the public. And this hypocrisy, yeah. you know, and uh, nobody even uh, thought that what are these people even demanding? I mean, there are raids all over the world. So many clubs get closed, etc., etc. But you should understand that in Georgia, we don't rave for pleasure always. We play, we rave for survival. That it's a survival for people like who feel like uh, uh, threatened in the streets, who feel threatened in their own families. This club employs, half of the imp uh, employers employees are people having a drug-related problem with the law or uh, queer kids uh, uh, kicked out from their families. And, uh, you know, this was uh, why uh, we were, uh, I mean, we couldn't let it go like that. And uh, uh, it was kind of a signal for the entire clubbing movement in the world that they should uh, use this energy for something good. And in Berlin, they st started anti-Nazi demonstrations, rave demonstrations. They used our slogan. They made the reference to us, everything. Uh, and then it was in uh, Paris. It was uh, 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 ecological. Uh, then it, uh, it was uh, several weeks after, like very soon after, you know, uh, in, uh, I think, in uh, the Hague, uh, in uh, Hague, I think, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it clearly had some impact. Uh, it clearly gave some hope to the people uh, who could not otherwise express themselves. It was the only safe space for expression. 
I don't know, can we show some of the pictures of how dance floor actually became uh, the conference space as well and everything? Yeah, else? yeah, I, I think uh, Marion might have pictures of the stuff in Berlin. But one of the questions that we got was, can we send links to all the works and all these different um, kinds of things that we've mentioned? And um, we, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, and Pata, I feel like, uh, well, actually, there was that whole uh, thesis thing that was written about uh, this movement, which we can share too, which I, I got really excited about. Um, and I'll see if Miriam can run those photos. But again, we'll make sure it gets into the video. Um, I'm looking at some of these questions. And um, what I wanted to ask was... Um, well, here's, this is related to a question that someone's asking about, you know, the focus on joy and activism is great. Um, do you think that there's, uh, our party, is there like a thing where you're like, man, uh, parties are great, but sometimes people take it too far <laughs> or something like this issue, or is it just like a matter of, um, figuring out a way to do it? Cause it seems like the, all the different issues that you're talking about are so deadly serious in a lot of ways. Um, on, and the, or the ramifications are so massive um, or global, right? Like, um, it, but is there anything where you would say that maybe uh, this wasn't the right fit or the ideas behind it weren't the right fit? That's fine, Kate. Yeah, just shaking your head is fine. <laughs> I'll, I will say that I think um, what can be taken seriously and what can be seen as humorous is a big part of the power struggle. And so when we are making fun of very serious people, for example, uh, who consider themselves to be very serious, we are submitting, subverting the power structure. When we are making light of what has been uh, categorized or enforced as very serious or very dire, uh, we that is a power shift. And so I think when you're saying thank God for abortion or you're saying shout your abortion, um, those slogans like it, it, you basically can't take it too far because mm -hmm. the opposite is constantly being reinforced. And, and by that, they're asserting power over you and your dignity and autonomy. So Another group we work closely with is called uh, Thank God for Abortion. They do, you know, they have an abortion pope. They do, you know, I've marched with them in pride parades where they have, uh, you know, I dressed as a nun and my partner dressed as a priest with a real priest cassock. Uh, and, you know, we marched in the streets saying, thank God for abortion. The next year they, they did abortion cheerleaders and we had a cheerleading theme. And we just said, like, you know, rah, rah, abortion. Um, and we made up all these cheers. Like, it's it's incredibly important to do those types of things, even though other people would say that goes too far. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's exactly what you have to do in order to take away their power. If they're the ones who gets to decide what's serious and what's not serious, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, um, then they're the ones who are in control. And if we're the ones who get to say abortion is funny, abortion is fun, abortion is spiritual, abortion is, you know, all of these different things, that means we're the ones in control. Yeah, I, uh, it's not always true, but it kind of tends to be true that people, governments and stuff, they can kind of only speak in one voice. You know, the last few years that's changed a bit but they do not have as much latitude as we have in like how we address things. And that's, that's to our advantage. Um, uh, I want to wrap up cause we have just a few minutes left. And I, one of the things I was thinking about when you guys were all talking, was like, this could be a book. Like this, <laughs> just, these are three really great examples that are different, but like connect in these ways. And, um, and two, the ideas like are so, so need to be heard and, Pata, I want to do more with you just because I think that the story of what happened and how it happened is so um, so great and not known here in in the United States, especially. Um, but uh, yeah, the idea, I think, I mean, I'm just kind of repeat something that I said at the beginning, but I think it's been drawn out through this whole thing, which is that it's both like this 
act of defiance, right? And like a demonstration of the world that you want, um, or that is in some cases, right? That just, it's, it's just not seen, but also like this attracts people. It's, it, it makes it uh, something that like, you know, like I, people know how to dance or like they know, they understand clubs, right? Um, they understand a lemonade stand, right? And so you give them that familiar access point and then there's a new way into this movement, right? Um, and it makes it more sustainable for us. Uh, and, you know, we need that too. So um, I want to encourage people not just to listen to these ideas and be like, wow, that was really cool. I learned a lot. But to actually put them into practice, like think about how you can use this in your actual work, whatever it is that you're working on. Um, and that idea too of the familiar entry point um, leads into our talk, ne uh, which is on September 15th, the next revolutionizing activism. We September 15th, 12 o'clock. Um, it's called Feast and it's gonna feature Don Walenke and John Rubin of Conflict Kitchen, um, who, they have this restaurant that only makes food or only made food that um, was uh, from countries that the United States is in conflict with. Um, and again, it's that like familiar entry point, right? Um, and then uh, we have Tunde Wei from Lagos and Asia Dorsey representing warm cookies for the revolution. And you can read more about it and register for that at our website. We'll also be turning this into a, a video that we'll be posting. Um, and then also right now, the Center for Artistic Activism is doing a fundraising campaign where we're not actually trying to get an amount of money. We're trying to get an amount of donors and the number is 50. And I think we're like, we've passed the halfway point. So, um, if you saw me and you were like, Hey, I, I would, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Don't do that. Just go to the c4a.org slash donate. And, um, and then that way we can keep doing this. Um, also, again, want to thank past donors that have helped make this possible. And of course, um, Jay, it's always great to um, see you and um, hear from you and the thought and wisdom and expertise that you bring to this. Um, you know, it's just a treat. And Kate, really nice to meet you. And um, you're doing important work and doing it in a great way. So keep it up. And Pata. Um, someday we will hang out in person again and, um, and yeah, it's like, so I just, uh, the idea that you have of what you accomplished, um, with this movement in Georgia and what it means for so many people, I know with all these things that all of you are talking about, that there's still work to do that, you know, the, the triumphs that you've had, there's, there's always setbacks that follow, but they are still triumphs and they're so, um, so important and so inspiring, at least to me and hopefully to people watching this. So thank you uh, to all three of you and everyone that is watching and um, <laughs> um, can't wait to see you all again.